Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Google Cloud uh, Lunch and Learn. My name is Ingrid Gonzalez, and I'm the Google Cloud Sales Director based out of New York. So we, on behalf of the Google Cloud family, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. I hope that you, your family, as well as your colleagues are doing well during this challenging time. This Lunch and Learn is part of the weekly Tech Talk series. Our goal is to serve you better. Previously, we cover topics such as business continuity, DevOps, Kubernetes. Our goal is to have this session as interactive as possible. We want to share with our customers best practices. I encourage you to sign in now. The link is available in the live chat box. As soon as you sign in, we'll send you the deck and a feedback form. Please provide us feedback and topic you would like us to uncover during the next session. We learn with you and from you. So after today's session, you will have the opportunity to discuss questions. Please write your questions in a YouTube live chat box. Without waiting, I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce you today our speaker, Eric Smith. Eric is a developer advocacy lead for data analytics and applied data science within Google Cloud. His team focuses on enabling data engineer data analysts and data scientists across data pipelining, data warehousing, streaming analytics, and business intelligent workloads. Prior to his advocacy role, Eric was the founding product manager for Cloud Dataflow, bringing forth a unified model for batch and stream processing. Today, we'll talk about the future pillars in BigQuery with a lens toward how you use them for various scenarios. So without waiting, Eric, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Flip over to present. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Hello and welcome to an overview of BigQuery as we look at features, use cases, and best practices. As Ingrid said, my name is Eric Schmidt, and I lead the data analytics and data science developer advocacy team within Google Cloud. My team works with customers and practitioners at large, helping them to build data analysis pipelines. You can reach me at cloudy at google.com or on Twitter at not that Eric or my opinions are my own. Thank you for joining me today. To start with, I'd like to lay out the overall focus for this talk. This talk is about BigQuery. But more specifically, this talk is also about BigQuery, BigQuery primarily through the lens of technical practitioners. I'm talking about the DBAs who manage infrastructure, schema changes, and deal with access control, or data engineers who build data transformation pipelines and toil over ever-expanding processing demands of data, or data analysts driving descriptive analytics and data scientists seeking to formulate new questions about the past and future. Now, if you're an ITDM making purchasing decisions or a CISO wrangling cross-organization security challenges or maybe a chief decision maker, you should also find this talk useful as it will shine light on the value proposition of BigQuery beyond technical fundamentals. If you're new to Google Cloud or maybe a seasoned pro, it's still important to understand the product landscape for this talk as I just won't be addressing BigQuery. I'll also be talking about and expanding into the broader product portfolio inside of the data analytics offerings on Google Cloud. Now, as a side note for a little bit of fun, here is a printable poster that has every Google Cloud product along with a four word or less description. Now, whenever I started on Google Cloud back in 2013, I think there were six products of which BigQuery was one of them. So grab the uh, high-res poster or wallpaper from the GitHub link below, print it out, and you can impress your fellow cloud and data nerds. Now, 
instead of looking at products, I'm going to dive into a concept that we call solutions. Now, Google Cloud Platform has eight primary solutions, smart analytics being one of them. And the way I like to talk about this is that it's easy to talk about a single product. It's simple. But in the real world, as practitioners, we live and operate from a solutions pr perspective. This is typically framed as, I need to solve for X problem. And in order to do so, I need A, B, and C products implemented with Y and Z patterns. So this framing can get a little messy because you start mixing and matching different processes, products, and patterns. So we shift away from data analytics as a product grouping, and we dive into smart analytics. Now, a quick warning. I have a few more architecture slides to make sure we're on the same page, and then we're going to get into SQL and code. Here we're going to lay out what the Google Cloud Smart Analytics platform looks like. Google Cloud Smart Analytics enables four solution areas. Streaming analytics, data lake and data lake modernization, data warehouse modernization, and business intelligence with integrated data science workflow. With BigQuery at the heart of these architectures and solutions. So using the solution rubric that I stated in the last slide, we can state a problem like, I need to calculate store sales in real time. And for that, I need a stream ingestion mechanism, a streaming analytics engine, and a scalable, durable cache stitched together with selected patterns. So what is BigQuery? And why am I talking about streaming and data lakes? BigQuery is a serverless, fully managed, highly scalable, and cost-effective cloud data warehouse designed for business agility. It enables you to analyze bytes, megabytes, or petabytes of data using standard ANSI SQL at blazing fast speeds with zero operational overhead with enterprise-grade security. At the same time, BigQuery also provides integrated GIS capabilities. It has an in-memory analysis service, and it also has built-in machine learning features. Oh, by the way, BigQuery turned 10 years old this week. Um, whenever I started back in 2013, we had just added joins as a feature. So 10 years of innovation, and if you go online, you can Google uh, for lots of happy birthday wishes and some reflection by various product team members, engineers, and others in the ecosystem who have benefited from this amazing product. So happy birthday, BigQuery. Now that you know what BigQuery is at a high level, let's look at how it's built. What is it inside of this implementation? The first key point on this slide to understand is the separate of the storage system that stores information to be queried and the query engine itself. Now, this separation provides several important benefits. First of all, BigQuery stores data in a proprietary columnar format called Capacitor, which, as it evolves over time, can provide more optimization, specifically through data layout optimization. The data is physically stored on Google's distributed file system, which is called Colossus. This is, ensures durability uh, through something called erasure encoding, where we store redundant chunks of data on multiple physical disks. And moreover, this data is replicated throughout multiple data centers. Another key point is that as optimizations occur in the query engine, they can be rolled out to the entire customer base with zero downtime. So we can mix and match how optimizations are added to both the storage system and the query engine. The second key point to understand here is that these subservices, storage, compute, et cetera, they all run on serverless, on a serverless resource model, which behind the scenes is fully managed by Google. So if you're coming from an on-premise and or a monolithic data warehouse and or data lake implementation, this may be a completely different model for you, a model that changes how you think about how you build and manage such systems. 
drilling in deeper, it changes the game because BigQuery replaces this concept of typical hardware setup and deployment. There is nothing to deploy with BigQuery or manage from an infrastructure perspective. From there, you can quickly iterate and grow a basic data mart using data sets and table constructs. You can then use and deploy tables as a source of truth to define schemas for a data lake, both within BigQuery or outside of BigQuery storage system. Um, your data lake may contain files elsewhere, like on cloud storage, Google Drive, or a transactional system like Cloud Bigtable. BigQuery also provides Cloud Identity Access Management, or IAM, to grant permissions to specific actions within BigQuery. This replaces traditional concepts like SQL, grant, and revoke. Ultimately, you can develop and deploy insights in real time at scale with BigQuery. Now, with all of this framing in place, let's dig in to some SQL in code. Now, as I was preparing for this talk over the weekend, I, like the majority of you, were also experiencing some very challenging times with protests, civil unrest, and dealing with the COVID pandemic. These are very challenging times. Now, at the same time here in Seattle, where I live, we also experience some very violent weather over the weekend, which included lightning. To which my seven-year-old asked while we were eating dinner, if we get more lightning here in Seattle than grandma does who lives on the East Coast. This is something we talk about a lot, mainly because we don't get a lot of lightning here in Seattle. So for this demo, we're gonna do a very simple kind of data analysis data science experiment, which is, let's formulate a question. Do we get more lightning here in Seattle than in grandma who lives on the East Coast? So we started thinking about this. Well, where can we go get that information? Can we go to the news? Could we go to no websites? Could we Google it? It turns out this is a fairly challenging question to ask if you want to compare lightning strikes between two cities. And then also, once we start querying the data, we have to understand what my boundaries are, what is here in terms of if we live in Seattle, where are we defining here in terms of those lightning strikes? Are we talking about in our neighborhood, across the city, et cetera? And then once we have the ability to query the data, can we visualize it to see if it makes sense and does it answer the question? So with that, let's flip over to BigQuery. What you see here is the BigQuery Cloud Console. And on the left-hand side, if I scroll down, um, you start to see different projects that ha I have access to. Now, you have access uh, to the, some of these projects as well. For example, you have access to something called the BigQuery Public Data Project. And inside of that, there are a bunch of freely publicly available data sets that you can use to perform analysis. And if I scroll down to one called NOAA Lightning, there's a lot of data sets in here. You can see that I have tables for lightning strikes from current year all the way back until 1987. And the schema looks like this, basically day, the number of strikes, and the center point. So if I preview it, it's a fairly basic layout. So I sat down with my son and I started asking questions like, how close do you think a lightning strike would be if it was close to our house? And we, agree, we agreed upon roughly around five miles. So since this is in uh, meters, I just did some conversion. And then from there, we used built-in GIS functions inside of BigQuery to calculate the distance between where the lightning struck, according to the record, and the center point in our neighborhood, both for our house and grandma's house. And then from there, I'm using a function called table wildcards so that I can query across all of these years and do some aggregation. So let's run this, this query and see what happens. Now, keep in mind, in the background, BigQuery just went and scanned all of the data in storage 
and we scanned 4.9 gigs in roughly 5.4 seconds. So this query looks like it's producing reasonable results. I have distance to our house, which is seems very, very far away. And this strike was fairly close to grandma's house on the East Coast. Great, so I've effectively built this query, but it really doesn't tell a story yet. Does it answer the question, you know, who effectively gets more lighting? So what I'm gonna do is flip over to another tool, which is called AI Platform Notebooks. And here, once I jump out of BigQuery, I can jump into AI Platform Notebooks, and I have a notebook already pre-built that helps me interact live and in real time with that same information inside of BigQuery. And we're gonna talk more about different access mechanisms later. But suffice to say, I'm gonna import some libraries. I'm gonna connect to BigQuery. I'm gonna take that same query that I wrote and we'll go ahead and execute it here. So go out, rerun the same query and I get the results back. Pump them back into a data frame so that I can see them here. This is pretty helpful, but let's go ahead and visualize this and bring this to life. So in this view, I'm gonna go ahead and filter out lightning strikes that were close to our house. So over the years, you can basically see we don't get a lot of lightning. Some, some days it's basically zero. Looks like we had a peak here. And there was a lot of strikes back in 1999, but a lot being 40. If I go down and I look at what happens in Pittsburgh around grandma's house, you can see the scale is much different. You know, they have multiple storms that range in the peaks of 200. And on average, if I just do an eye test, lightning strikes are between 50 and 100 with a really, really, really big surge. This was a massive storm uh, back in July of 2018. So there we go. We can definitively say that yes, Pittsburgh gets way more lightning strikes, at least in this location, compared to what's happening in Seattle in our neighborhood. And the beauty here is we were able to do all of this with zero infrastructure. I didn't have to ingest any data. I didn't have to move any data. All I had to do was express a query, execute it, and then visualize it. Now, as an aside, my son then started to ask, do we get more rain here in Seattle versus uh, Pittsburgh, and I just looked at him and said, mm, I'm not sure, but there's another public data set we can play with into that. Uh, he was no longer interested. So let's get back to BigQuery and features. What I'm gonna walk through next is how you inter interact with BigQuery. There are multiple ways to do it. I just showed you one of them, which is through the developer console. This is typically where you would spend a lot of your time initially as you learn the product mainly because it provides you almost complete access to all of the API operations within BigQuery. Um, it's also easy to access job and query history. So as you execute queries like I did, I can go back and pull up queries that I've ran in the past. I can also save them and share them easily with others. The editor also provides visual uh, hints as you're typing out syntax to make sure that those queries are correct. You can also do some inline exploration with Sheets and Data Studio. So over here, over here, I could say explore data and push this out to Sheets and start doing very similar analysis inside of Sheets versus doing it inside of say an IPython notebook. We'll talk more about this later. Another way to interact with BigQuery is through the BigQuery SDK that comes with the Google Cloud SDK. So this is a command line SDK. Um, this is an excellent way to learn the full API. You can imagine doing nothing in the console that I just showed you and doing everything from the command line. So this in essence helped build a lot of muscle memory about different functions and ways to interact with BigQuery. Now, truth be told, I end up using a combination of all these tools that I'm showing you. Um, specifically, I like to use the command line tool is basically an auditing tool. So as I'm maybe running things in the console or I have background jobs running in code, I can also use the command line to basically audit and tail what's happening with the system. 
One other nice benefit is inside of Google Cloud, we have something called Cloud Shell. So if you fire up Cloud Shell, the Google Cloud SDK is pre-installed and it is a free compute instance for you to basically do any type of console-based uh, SSH work. Another way to interact with BigQuery is through client libraries. Um, or you could build your own library on top of the BigQuery REST API, which is what the client libraries are built on top of. So in my Python, I Python notebook uh, that I showed you, I'm using the Python client library. Um, I highly suggest that you end up using the client li libraries as the pre-built because they're fully supported. And we have a common documentation and sample model across all of these libraries. Um, as another you know, side note, I was using AI Platform Notebook, AI Platform Notebooks, which is a feature of the Google Cloud Platform, and it has uh, pre-installed all of these libraries for you as well. So as I jumped into this notebook, I had to do very, very little bootstrapping uh, in order to start doing my analysis. So, and we already talked about this quickly, you can um, easily integrate with BigQuery through uh, Sheets, Google Sheets, as well as Data Studio. Um, I, the, the reverse is true. I could start my journey inside of Sheets or inside of Data Studio, um, which is a way to build visualizations. Or I could go ahead and pipe results out of the console into these environments. Now, taking a step back, you know, deeper into more classic business intelligence tools, we have a broad spectrum of partners with deep integrations with BigQuery, specifically Tableau and Looker. So NetNet, if you have choice, you have choices out there. If you find yourself spending maybe a little bit too much time in the console um, and you're restricted on what you're trying to do, um, look around. You have lots of options. Next, I'm going to turn to talk about ingestion and interaction, interacting with data in more detail. So like the access options that I just showed you, you have a collection of ways to ingest as well as query data from BigQuery. So on the left-hand side, you can use tools like Cloud Dataflow or Data Prep to transform and load data into BigQuery. BigQuery can also import data um, in uh, various formats, CSV, JSON, as long as it's new line delimited. You can also import Avro, Parquet, and org formats. You can use the data transfer service, DTS, to automate ingestion or, and or transformation, transform data from other cloud providers. So you have data on AWS S3, you can use DTS to pull that data over and load it into BigQuery. You can use DTS to also connect to SaaS applications like Salesforce and SAP. Another way that you can uh, import data is just straight through the API. So basically any place where you can get code up and running you can insert data into BigQuery tables. So you could be running on a compute engine engines, maybe inside of a container on Kubernetes, App Engine, et cetera. The one caveat here, though, is that you have to recreate all the data processing foundation, making connections, dealing with um, error cases, et cetera. So a, a good best practice is to use a high-level uh, primitive, something like Cloud Data Proc or Dataflow, um, that, have, that has these type of implementations built in. And I'll show you that in a minute. Now, on the right-hand side, you can access and query data across other BigQuery data sets, just like the one that I showed you with the Lightning data set. All the storage is man managed in another project, in our public data sets project. You can also execute federated queries over other databases from BigQuery, like Cal Cloud SQL, which is a managed version of MySQL. Now, one of the unique aspects of BigQuery is that you can choose to load data in batches, or you can load data in real time via stream ingestion. And there are a few decision points here on when to use what and when. So if you need to use daily, if you need your data updated on a daily or weekly basis, batch loading is more than likely a solid choice. Now, if you start to reduce your load window, say to under five minutes, and you have lots of tables to ingest, streaming ingestion may be a better choice. You, you can mix and match um, these models. For example, you may have one table that is batch loaded, say on a daily basis or weekly basis, and then another table which is stream loaded from the same source, but you're only doing 20% sampling of real-time events. 
Another way to load or generate data is basically through a simple select statement, where you basically select results from a local uh, data set or from a remote data set, and then save those results back into your data set to create new tables. I'll show you a demo of this in a minute. All right. So let's look at uh, some streaming workflow. We talked about streaming and the ability to ingest data in real time. So I'm going to flip over to this console, which is Google Cloud Dataflow. And specifically, this is a running pipeline um, that uh, has been running for about a day or so now. Um, this pipeline is ingesting transactional data from a uh, fictitious retailing system that I built. It's also ingesting clickstream data um, from browser activity related to this retailer. And it's also looking at some real-time stock information. So it's ingesting this, the, this information from Cloud PubSub. It's doing some transformations on those streams. Um, it's doing a, a, a little bit of aggregation where I'm looking at counts within a particular time window. And then it also passes all of the data through back out and writes it into BigQuery in real time. So you can see here on the right-hand side, we're roughly doing around 227 to maybe we spike up to around 700 events a second. So as new transactions come in, they're processed in real time, written into BigQuery, and also aggregated in real time. So with this streaming pipeline in place, I can go back over to BigQuery and we're going to run a query. We're going to run a query that tails that table where the data is being written from my cloud data flow pipeline. So let's go ahead and run this. I have no cache results on. And what we should see is basically event time for the events that are flowing through the pipeline, the current timestamp, um, and then the, the event that I'm looking at, which in this case, I'm just looking at some basic clickstream data and the page reference that it was associated with. So this will take probably around 23 to maybe 25 seconds to run. So there you go. We scanned 72 gigs of data. It took 28 seconds and we're running right about a second behind live. So if you look at UTC now on your clocks, you can see that we are indeed streaming live into this table. This is great. So I have effectively ingested, acquired real-time stream information and put it into BigQuery so it's immediately actionable. Now, the next bit I want to show you is how to query external sources. In this case, is, in this case I'm going to ex query some data that's living inside of Cloud SQL. So I showed you that I had real-time clickstream information coming in from Dataflow into BigQuery. But I also have some stock-level information that I need to reach out to that's sitting inside of a MySQL uh, implementation. So with that, I have something called a federated query. And I'm going to switch my projects over to the project where my federated connection exists. And if you see here, I have something called local operations, which the connection type is called Cloud SQL MySQL. Up top, I have a query. And there is a from clause that says, I want to extract some information from an external query from local operations looking at stock levels. So in this case, this Cloud SQL instance has a stock level information that's manually reconciled on a daily basis. But at the same time, I have all my sales information, my orders information that I showed you that's being streamed through Cloud Dataflow, and I want to join these two. So let's go ahead and run this query. 
I'm going to reach out to execute a query into Cloud SQL as, as well as run a local query in BigQuery, join these two. And I can look at reconciliation. So at this store, for this day of sale, I sold 80, 85 units. And at the end of the day, I had 56 units on hand. This is really powerful because instead of me having to basically do, go do some type of ETL job and pull all that information out of Cloud SQL into a, a local table in BigQuery, I can simply reach out, federate, and do the join on the fly. The other thing I want to quickly show is uh, query materialization. Um, I have a query that I ran. This is actually last night. Um, it took uh, two, almost three hours uh, to run, and it processed 24 terabytes of data. Up top, it's, you see it's a fairly simple query. I'm basically doing um, a group by on some order information by the, uh, basically by week, by store, by order, hour of day. In essence, I wanted to look to see what type of order volume I have on a per hourly basis inside of a store. So I scanned the entire order lines um, by geo table, which resulted in processing 24 terabytes of data. Um, and the output of this are, is quite simple. I could use this output as a fact table for some type of data analysis. So in this case, all I have to do is say save results, go back to BigQuery table, and I'll call this uh, maybe facts by store week. And if I hit save, I can project all the results from that query back as a table. Now, you know, I could continue to run this query over and over again, say on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. The point here is I'm basically doing my transformation and loading in line inside of BigQuery instead of having this to move this data out and run those transformations. Now that we have some architectural fundamentals in place, let's look at the resource economy and also understand some performance tips. So BigQuery is very powerful. So it's important to understand the resourcing and how resources are used and the cost models so that you can better serve your needs. Now, if you recall on that slide about the query engine, take note of those little compute models inside of the query engine, um, aka Dremel. Those little compute units um, in BigQuery parlance are called slots. So a BigQuery slot is a unit of computational capacity that's used to execute queries. So a BigQuery underneath the covers automatically calculates how many slots required by each query, depending on the size and complexity. So a slot at the end of the day is just a combination of CPU, memory, networking resources. It also has a couple of other technologies and subservices. Um, and a slot from a developer's perspective engineering perspective is approximately a half a VM compute, one gig of memory. Um, although specifications keep changing over time because as data centers are upgraded and underlying hardware is upgraded, the abilities of these slots continue to improve. So, you know, under the hood, think about the analytics throughput in BigQuery is really measured by slots. If you want things to run faster, you apply more slots. If you have more concurrent queries um, and you don't provide more slots, then you have basically a slower throughput rate. So there are ways to, to, um, to basically modulate and dial in how fast you want to run or how fast you want to deplete outstanding jobs. So now that you understand slots, let's talk about the pricing model. There are effectively two pricing models that you can mix and, mix and match inside of your organization and projects. One is referred to as on-demand, which is really a consumption-based model. And the other one is called flat rate, which is a capacity-based model. So on-demand pricing, which is the, the default uh, pricing that you get with BigQuery, is you pay for the amount of data process of $5 per terabyte. Your first terabyte per month is free. And by default, projects get a 2,000 slot allotment. So you basically get 2,000 slots to execute uh, queries. And there is some burstability, but as available. There's no guarantee that you're you know, always going to get bursting over 2,000 slots. So on-demand pricing is really good for spiky workloads as long as you dot, dot, dot 
understand the overall uh, capacity load that you're going to be pushing through those slots. Now, one of the issues sometimes is that it's a little bit more challenging to budget due to variability, because if you're running queries that are processing different amounts of data, you know, one day you could be spending, say, $10, the next day you could be spending $25, depending on how much data you're pushing through the system. Um, so net-net, it's a little bit more uh, challenging um, as concurrency grows and the complexity of your queries grow. So it's as a solid choice, though, whenever you're ramping up on workflow and or you have very, very predictable usage patterns. Now, on the flip side, flat rate pricing is a fixed capacity model where you basically pay for fixed capacity and you pay the same amount regardless of how many queries you submit. Um, now, the basic flat rate pricing is that you can cancel after 30 days. So you basically commit to um, a number of slots, a minimum of 500 slot commitments, and then you have 30 days, in this case, uh, to use those slots. There's a no limit to the number of commitments you have. So you could have commitments for 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 slots, depending on the overall load. Um, one of the nice things about flat rate pricing is it provides very, very stable budgeting. Um, but what happens if you want to um, extend the capacity of your flat rate slots? So uh, recently, we introduced this new concept called the flat rate flex slots. So you're basically paying for a flex slot capacity, regardless how many queries you submit. Um, however, you can now buy these um, slots at a much smaller commitment. So you're basically spending $200 per hour for five hundred slot commitment, but you can cancel these slots after 60 seconds. So you can basically say, hey, I want to commit. I need to do some really, really big workload for say three minutes. I commit to those slots, I use them, and then I go away. So this provides very, very stable budgeting, but it also provides you the ability to deploy additional resources as you see fit. So let's go ahead and uh, run through some uh, cost estimation and optimization techniques so you can better understand how these concepts apply to you. So I'm going to jump back over to my notebook. And I'm in this um, notebook called Understanding Scan Costs. So in an on-demand model, like I said, you're going to pay based on the amount of data that's processed. If I go ahead and run this query, you'll see that this query would have scanned almost a terabyte of data and would have cost me $4. Now, the way that I did this was I set the job configuration to dry run as true. I didn't actually execute this query. I only asked the system to tell me how much data it would scan. Now, of note, you know, if I were to say limit one, this is kind of an anti-pattern in BigQuery, it would scan the same amount of data because in this case, um, it's how much data that we're scanning, not necessarily how much data we're rendering. Um, so how would I make improvements to this overall cost of this query? Well, the first thing I can do is I could add some partitioning. So in this case, I'm going to partition uh, by date. So I take that non-partition table, I'm going to select from it, and I'm going to apply a partition and create a new table. And let's see what the cost on that table would look like. So now I've gone down to uh, 81 cents. Uh, major, major reduction, roughly around, say, 83% or so of the original cost. And you can see that the terabyte scan, the amount of data was scanned, because now I'm only looking for a very specific um, set of date partitions. Another thing that you can do is you can add clustering. So clustering will provide optimization on pruning out um, elements within a where clause. So in this case, I'm looking for a particular page target. So again, I'll go ahead and create a table. So I have my partitioning by my date from before, but now I'm also going to cluster by page target. And if I run this query now on top of that optimized table, um, I actually executed this query. This query cost me 0.001 cents. Um, and it consumed 592 slot millis. So now this is a highly, highly optimized um, uh, query. So I've gone from roughly you know, $4.8 down to 0.01 cents on the exact same 
query using partitioning and uh, clustering techniques. Now, there's much more about this topic, specifically understanding the cardinality of the data. And so the, the use case that I came up with is a fairly classic use case. So I'm, I'm using um, columns that have lower cardinality, things like uh, dates, month counts as my partition, and things that have slightly higher cardinality, um, like page or product counts for my clustering. I encourage you to go read much more about this, but this will set you down the path of optimizing your queries. Now, the other thing I want to quickly demo is this concept of reservations. So if you remember before, I talked about you could go out and commit to a number of slots in order to execute queries, especially, especially if you have some type of resource um, uh, constraint. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and use the BigQuery API to list all of the reservations and commitments I have outstanding. So it looks like right now I have 500 slots um, currently deployed. And let's say my ops and ETL department came over and said, hey, we have some bursty workloads that are coming up um, this afternoon, maybe in the next five minutes, uh, maybe in the next week. We need 1,000 more slots. Instead of having to go through a bunch of uh, deployment, et cetera, you can easily use this API to basically go create a commitment, go create a reservation, and then apply that reservation to an assignment. So let's go ahead and do this. So whenever I run this, this code, it's going to go out to make the commitment, apply the reservation, and then um, make those 1,000 slots available. So extremely, extremely powerful. Um, and after 60 seconds, I can go ahead and tear down those, those thousand slots. Um, one last piece around pricing, et cetera. There's also a sandbox option where you can sign up. There's no credit card required. So this is the, kind of the complete ante of um, the uh, slot process that I was just talking about. So if you're just getting started, you can sign up with no credit card re required. It's 10 gigs of active storage, and you get one terabyte of process queries per month. So the next one of the the next thing and kind of the second to last thing I want to talk about is machine learning. Now, if you are um, familiar with machine learning, this is kind of a, a common uh, model that you or flow that you would uh, follow whenever you're building out machine learning models. You typically identify a problem. You have to pre-process your data, maybe do some splitting, then actually build the model um, itself using various techniques, whether it's in TensorFlow um, um, or other SDKs. You then train, then you evaluate, then you deploy, and then you make predictions. It's kind of a classic flow. And one of the things that we've done in BigQuery is we've implemented this concept of BigQuery ML, which effectively lets you identify a problem, skip a lot of the pre-processing, splitting, and actual model fabrication and let you just focus on identification of problem, training it, and then making predictions. Right now, there are um, a collection of different model types that you can implement inside of BigQuery ML. So we have linear regression for basic estimation. You could do logistic regression. You could do clustering. Um, we have matrix factorization, which works well for recommendation systems. And we recently announced um, ARIMA uh, for forecasting, which is an alpha. You can also import TensorFlow models back into BigQuery for, um, for prediction if you have trained them someplace else. So in this case, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to run a forecast. This is the, the, the retailing site that I was talking about that I'm addressing all of my uh, Clickstream inventory and purchasing data. And what I was asked here is that uh, my boss came in and said, hey, I want to get a quick forecast on our clickstream data. Now, fortunately, I have all that clickstream data and sales data flowing into my data warehouse. So let's look at how BQML, BQML can be used to build a forecasting model over that data. Now, back in my AI notebook, I start this journey. So basically, I'm going to do a quick inspection on top of my clickstream data. So you can see this here. Um, uh, looks 
you know, very, very basic. I pruned out some columns because what I really want to do is just focus on how many people are coming and browsing into the site. I'm basically trying to project out what type of traffic I'm going to see in the future on my site. So I take that query um, and I do some reduction because what I really want to do is I want to look at traffic by day, not necessarily by individual product. So I go ahead and do a group by, and now I can see um, sales and browsing activity by day. So this is good. I've basically effectively created the target set that I want to build my model on. And this is the, in essence, magic, if you will, inside of BigQuery. I can write this statement, which is create a replace model. In this case, I'm gonna use a REMA for forecasting. I pass in the columns for uh, my sales, which is the target, and then the time series information, which is day. And I tell it, in essence, to go train a model. Um, this takes, depending on the size of your data, a couple seconds, up to a couple minutes or hours. You don't have to worry about the scalability because underneath the covers, we just scale out the number of slots needed in order to train the model. Then from there, I can go ahead and call forecast. So in this case, I want to forecast out 30 days beyond the data that I've loaded. Um, I do a little bit of graph development. And here are the outputs of that forecast. So here's all the historical information. And you can kind of see starting in January, you know, information or levels are a little bit low. Then they start to the spike. We have a little seasonality. We have a little bit more seasonality here. Kind of sales drop off. And then we're right into uh, starting in the summer. So you can kind of see that the forecast was 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 pretty on spots. We had a confidence interval right now of, of 90%. And you can kind of see right at the very end, it starts to drift. Problem here is I actually don't have enough data, uh, historical data about what's happening. We see a big, big spike. This is basically as people get into summer and they're starting to buy a lot more shoes. So one of the ways to solve this problem is to either provide some hints around seasonality because we know people are buying more shoes or get access to more data. Now the beauty here is I didn't have to export any of this information. It all stayed inside of BigQuery. So the flow is a lot more streamlined. And if I had to do more complex transformations on that input data, I could easily do that. I just go run some additional queries, save them back as tables and use those as my source of truth for the features that I would put into this model. Now, the last piece as we wrap up, kind of bring this all together, um, uh, is a demoing inside of Looker. And uh, I need to log back in to my account. And I may have typed that incorrectly. Oh, there we go. Um, let me bring this the correct dashboard up for you. There we go. So with my ETL in place, with all my fact tables in place, with my transformations in place, I can um, end up building out a fairly robust dashboard. In this case, I was using Looker because Looker provides a, a very powerful semantic model to layer on top of BigQuery schema. So it makes it easy for you to express concepts like funneling, conversion, et cetera, in human readable and repeatable patterns. So BigQuery is the source of truth for all my inputs, but Looker is the source of truth for all the semantics and meaning. All right, so we're pretty much at time. Uh, there are a ton of topics we didn't cover, things like access control, more fine-grained cost controls, using information schema to understand what's happening with queries that are being executed, monitoring logging. Um, there are all different types of ways to do uh, query optimization, et cetera. You know, after 10 years, there's a lot to cover, especially um, whenever you're constrained to 45 to 50 minutes. So with that, I encourage you to go get started. So you could sign up for the free tier if you just want to hack by yourself. If you have BigQuery already deployed and available inside of your company, um, ask um, for you to get a carve out onto a separate project for your own testing. Um, if you're already doing a lot of prototyping on BigQuery, check out the new flex, flex slot discount model. Um, it's a great way to start expanding um, workloads uh, and throughput for the data analysis processes that you're building.
And the last thing I'll leave you with is a couple of quick links. If you really want to get up to speed, I encourage you to go read uh, the book called Google BigQuery, The Definitive Guide. Um, it was written by two Googlers, Lok Lakshmanan and Jordan Tagani. Um, Lok is the head of solutions engineering for data analytics and ML. Jordan is the director of product management for BigQuery. So this is an excellent source of truth. Um, I also encourage you to learn more um, via the data engineering with Google Cloud course uh, series on Coursera, um, which also helps you um, get certified with the Google Professional Data Engineer certification. And last but not least, I encourage you to go out and follow these folks if you don't follow them already. Felipe Hoffa uh, is the lead developer advocate for BigQuery. He is an amazing source of information um, and uh, tribal knowledge for BigQuery. I would encourage you to follow Lack and Jordan because they are effectively tracking a lot of new features and architecture uh, information in real time, as well as the Tino T or Tina Tresco, who is one of the lead product managers as well on BigQuery. Follow them and then they will lead you to um, more and more uh, valuable information about BigQuery. And with that, so, I, thank you for, I thank you for your time and I hope um, you stay safe and healthy. So let's move over to some questions on the stream. Absolutely. Thank you, Erika. We do have a lot of questions from uh, our customer on the live stream. So thank you for this outstanding presentation. And just wanted to add a word to our customer. Do not hesitate to reach out to your Google account team. We are here to help you and to develop and further any uh, subject you would like to discuss uh, in the future. So um, the first question was answered already, but we have uh, the second one is from Antonio. Yeah. So hi there. I have a... um, so yeah, so I didn't talk about materialized views um, in this session. Um, they're uh, a new feature uh, coming to BigQuery. And in, Antonio, probably the best thing to do is if you just want to send me a, a mail and talk about, um, uh, we can dig into kind of what's happening with the materialized view itself. Uh, what's in uh, what's in the view? Uh, there are some edge cases where you may not see uh, performance improvements. So I'd be more than happy to take a look at that query and schema that you have uh, offline. Eric, can you escape the presentation mode, please? Thank you. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? So yeah, leave the presentation mode so customer can see you. Thank you. Oh, got it. Thanks. There we go. Great. Thank you. Sure. All right. So next question. Um, uh, da, da, da. Oh, so I'm going to skip down to the question from Alex. It says, do you have to still span for scan terabytes when using flex slots? The answer to that is no. So once you're on a um, uh, uh, a slot model, um, you're paying only for the, the slot costs, not through not, not for the scan costs. Um, the reason why I show those the, the demo though is to help you understand uh, how complex those queries would be because the more data that you're scanning, the more slot utilization you're more than likely going to consume. So I, as a best practice, I typically always will go ahead and look at the um, the, the scan volume whenever I'm writing queries, just so I make sure I understand um, the potential impact. And then also just looking at ways to gain efficiencies. A lot of times I'll prune off columns because I don't need them. Um, or I'll look at the table and say, oh, maybe I have a better partitioning or clustering scheme that I can come up with uh, to reduce uh, resource utilization. Um, Okay, so what is the meaning of slot minis for BigQuery job? How do I know the number of slots consumed by a query execution? Um, so uh, really good question. So uh, slot minis, view it as just basically an aggregate um, overall uh, slot time. So if you uh, looked at the output in um, the, say, the BigQuery console, it'll show you the overall uh, slot millis, which is the total on the number of seconds that were, milliseconds that were processed across um, all of the slots that were used. 
And then you also, it will also show you um, the effective wall clock time. So say um, the effective wall clock time for a query was one minute, but you used 10,000 or 100,000 milliseconds of, of slots. That means effectively you were processing, um, um, the, the, the processing was distributed over you know, N number of slots inside of, of that time window. Um, now, the one thing in, you could do is you could go dig into the actual query plan itself because as the query runs, as it, and it moves from stage to stage, in one stage, and maybe say using a smaller number of slots, and then the second stage, which is more uh, resource intensive, it expands out to um, a, much, a much wider uh, slot utilization. So the number that you see is basically just the total slot millis that we use for that particular query. Uh, let's see what else is in there. Oh, Antonio, sorry, I, I kind of I skipped over your question about the big query storage um, API. Um, yeah, I didn't get to talk about that either here, but um, in mail we could also dig into that because I'd be interested to understand what your use cases are, whether um, you know you're, you're basically looking uh, to build some type of SDK or integrate it into some type of other product. And uh, Vaishnavi, yes, I will post the. Um, these notebooks up on a GitHub link um, so that you can uh, play with them for sure. Wonderful. So if we do not have more questions, I'm just taking the last time we can definitely wrap up. So thank you, Eric, uh, for your presentation. It was very rich in terms of content. And uh, I want to thank the customer for your great questions. Uh, so I encourage you to subscribe uh, to the Google Cloud Forums, where you will see all the YouTube live session from the past or the one from today. As soon as you subscribe on the link as well, we'll be able to send you the presentation. Uh, and I also encourage you, as I mentioned earlier, to reach out to your Google Cloud account team. We are here to help and serve you. So do not hesitate. So thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us for the on every Wednesday at noon for our session of Lunch and Learn. And I wish all of you to stay safe. And I wish you a great week. Thank you, everyone, and talk to you very soon. Thanks.